unity and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the day that the Lord has made. Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to uh, St. Saviour's um, Church. Wonderful to see you all here uh, back in church and good to have you joining us um, from home as well. So wherever you are and however you're watching, it's great to have you with us, especially visitors. Welcome to St. Saviour's this morning. Um, today is the uh, second Sunday uh, in Advent, um, which I'll explain more of uh, in a moment. But uh, we're very much in that Advent season of uh, reflection, of uh, thinking about the people that God calls us to be and how we, we can better become those people. And so we continue the service in prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So even though um, the rules and regulations have changed once again, we still can't uh, sing um, as a congregation here in church. Though you'll be glad to know over Christmas we're going to have services, some services outside where we will um, be able to sing. Um, so we remain seated as we reflect on um, the words of this um, Advent hymn that reminds us that Advent is all about preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's not just in his nativity as uh, an infant at Christmas, but also in terms of his coming to us each and every day um, and how he calls us you know, to live lives that he made us uh, to live and calls us to live, and also ultimately at the end of time as we know it. Um, that is what Advent is about. So, over to you, uh, Cynthia. second candle on the Advent crown, um, and the Advent crown helps us to reflect on those people who point to the truth of Jesus and um, his coming amongst us. So the first candle we lit last um, Sunday is for the patriarchs, <coughs> excuse me, so that's people like Abraham and Isaac. This Sunday is for the prophets, um, so people like uh, Isa Isaiah, um, uh, actually we're looking at uh, John the Baptist is mentioned in our readings today, he's a prophet. Then um, we, have, uh, we have Mary, who's on the fourth one, and John the Baptist, 
is next Sunday. So, um, and, and the white candle in the middle, obviously, is with Jesus lit on Christmas Day. So we light our second candle that helps us to think about the prophets. And as that candle was lit, we pray together. Lord Jesus, light of the world, the prophets said you would bring peace and save your people in trouble. Give peace in our hearts at Christmas tide, and show all the worlds God's love. Amen. So in that prayer, we asked uh, God for ways in which we might reveal his love uh, to the world. And if we're honest, there's many times when we don't do that. We can be um, angry and stubborn and selfish and all those kind of things that come with what it means to be a human being. And um, when we behave out of those uh, motivations, we aren't revealing something of God's love. And that's when we need to say sorry to God. Repentance is all about turning back to love um, and to have God's love in our hearts that we can share with others. So in a moment's silence, let's just bring uh, into our hearts and minds the ways in which we've uh, hurt people through what we've said and done and not being those people of love that God calls us to be. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, Strengthen us to do God's will and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in a prayer with the collect for the second Sunday of Advent. O Lord, raise up, we pray, your power and come among us and with great might succor us that whereas Through our sins and wickedness, we are grievously hindered in running the race that is set before us. Your bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. So now to our readings that I think Phil and Brenda will be reading to us. The first reading is from 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless 
blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be. The second reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, and it's titled, John the Baptist Prepares the Way. <clears throat> The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thanks. to God. Thank you, Phil and Brenda. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be in my speaking and in our listening, that together we would know you more clearly love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. In Christ's name, amen. Mark is uh, perhaps my favorite gospel, not just because it's the shortest and quickest to read, but also because Mark writes his gospel with a sense of great urgency and directness that particularly appeals to me. We see this in this morning's gospel reading where Mark's first words are, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark begins his gospel in no uncertain terms. It's not a story about a good man or a wise teacher or a prophet. No, it's an account of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark spends the rest of his gospel explaining exactly why he believes this incredible claim to be true. And if you do nothing else this Advent in preparation for the coming of Christ, why not read this shortest and most direct of the Gospels from beginning to end in one sitting? It will only take you about an hour, and in so doing, you will be refreshing yourself in the good news about which Mark is writing. The Jewish nation at the time of Jesus had been waiting for such good news for a very long time. Mark quotes from the writings of the prophets Isaiah and Malachi, which go back to some 700 years before Christ. These writings promise that one day a Messiah will come to announce the arrival of a rescuer king, the Christ, who will lead God's people to freedom. In quoting these Old Testament passages, Mark makes it clear that he thinks John is this special messenger come to herald the arrival of the Saviour King. Good news indeed to a people who are being occupied and oppressed by the Roman nation. And yet John, who was so long expected, came with such an unexpected message. To those who thought themselves God's special people, John said, repent. This is perhaps just as an unpopular message today as it was all those years ago. We seem to live in an age where people will say anything but, I am sorry. One of the most popular books in the late 1990s, entitled, What They Don't Teach You at Harvard, Bu Harvard Business School, recognized this trend in our society. The book proposed three things that you are not taught that you desperately need to say. The first is, I am wrong. 
The second is, I am sorry. And the third is, please help me. Unless you say I'm wrong, you'll never move on in business. Unless you say I'm sorry, you'll, re you'll be regarded as arrogant. And unless you say, please help me, your self-sufficiency will be your downfall. This advice seems to me good preparation for thinking about a Christian's calling to repentance. The season of Advent in which we find ourselves shares with Lent a special focus on reminding God's people that we are called to repentance. Or, as Peter writes in this morning's epistle reading, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But what, then, exactly is repentance? How and why should we do it? And what does real repentance actually look like? Well, the word itself comes from a word which means to turn. Repentance means to turn away from evil and to turn towards God. Or, as Ezekiel, one of the Old Testament prophets, puts it, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why would you die, O house of Israel? Repentance, then, has three aspects to it. Firstly, there is a turning away from something. Secondly, there is a turning back towards something, or rather someone. And finally, there is the result of our repentance. So the first stage of repentance, then, is to turn away from something. But what? In the words of the book, what they don't teach you at Harvard Business School, we need to recognize that we are wrong, that we are not living life as we are meant to be living it. Some of us may feel that actually we are pretty much okay anyway and haven't got much to say sorry for because we haven't done much wrong compared to, say, the average prison inmate. God, however, calls us to compare our life against Jesus Christ's. Only then will we see how far short we fall of what he calls us to be. It's only then that we can see how wrong we are and just how many of his rules we break. At this point, we may also, like much of modern society, see rules as a negative, life-restricting imposition upon us. What right has God got to tell us how to live life anyway? If that's the case, then we need to understand that God doesn't give us rules because he is some cosmic killjoy, but rather to help us to live life to the full. Rules are good for us. A loving parent tells a child not to touch a hot fire or cross a road or eat berries, not because they want them to stop having fun, but because they don't want to see them getting hurt. Rules serve as an important function. Like training wheels on a bike, they point the beginner in the right direction and protect against injury. Once we realize that we are wrong, we then need to decide to turn towards something else, or rather, someone else. We are like a compass that constantly goes off true north. We constantly need to recalibrate to make sure we're going in the right direction. Repentance involves a recognition that we don't live life by our own flexible set of rules, but by God's, who made us and knows far better than us how we should live. Or as William Temple writes, to repent is to adopt God's viewpoint in place of our own. It means a complete reevaluation of all the things we're inclined to think good. The world, as we live in it, is like a shop window in which some mischievous person has got in overnight and shifted all the price labels round so that the cheap things have the high price labels on them and the really precious things are priced low. We let ourselves be taken in. Repentance 
means getting those price labels back in the right place. Repentance is also a desire and willingness to ask for help, help to change, to leave behind, to let go. And when we genuinely ask God for such help, he will come to our aid like a father running to greet his long lost son or a shepherd risking all to look for a lost sheep or a woman turning her house upside down to look for a lost coin. Because, you see, in repentance, we are not turning back to some cosmic head teacher who is waiting to give us a stern lecture, but rather a loving parent who so desperately wants to help us and encourage us and give us life to the full. This is the best motivation for repentance. Not guilt or shame, but rather love. We repent because we want to renew our relationship with a loving parent who does nothing other than reach out to us in love. And best of all, such a turning towards God is good for us. Matthew, in his gospel, records John saying this to the Pharisees and Sadducees, bear fruit worthy of repentance. The Bible contains several lists of such fruit that a turning towards God will cause to form in a person's life. Perhaps the most well-known is found in Paul's letter to the Galatians and consists of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who wouldn't, in their right mind, like to be a person full of that kind of fruit? And so, as we prepare for Christ's coming in his nativity, <clears throat> I say to you, as John said, repent, turn away from wrong, and turn towards your loving Heavenly Father, or, in the words of the book, what they don't teach you at Harvard Business School, admit to him that you are wrong. Tell him you're sorry and ask for his help and he will come running with outstretched arms to give you love and life to the full. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season of Advent in which we find ourselves. A season in which you call us to think about ultimate things. To think about, most especially, your will and your way for our lives. Father, help us, most especially, to turn from all that keeps us from being the people you created us to be, the people you call us to be. Help us to let go of those harmful habits. Help us to turn back to you, to be filled with the fruits of your spirit, and most especially to be people of love and life and joy and hope. Father, help us as we seek to become these people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so we stand to say together these um, words affirming the faith that we hold to. We believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated? 
So another um, great theme of uh, Advent is um, light coming into darkness. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to an Advent carol service. It's one of my favorite carol services. It's on Advent Sunday, right at the beginning of, um, of Advent. And it usually happens in a dark church um, with the choir at the back of the church um, uh, singing a, a glorious Advent hymn. And then as they come into the church, the church gradually... Um, the light follows the choir, so the church comes alive. Um, it's a beautiful sort of sense of light coming into the darkness uh, of the world. This is a very uh, contempor- contemporary sort of version of that vision, light in my darkness. Um, it, the words are beautiful, particularly perhaps reflecting on the times through which we're going now, um, ever-changing, slightly confusing, not sure what's happening. Um, we all need a bit of light in our darkness, so... Uh, perhaps uh, reflect on this as a prayer now.
And so now let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all human need. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, constant saviour, friend forever, in this Advent season we come to you with grateful hearts, but also with our sadness and concerns for a broken world. We thank you that we do not have to make an appointment to speak to you. We are never put on hold, and you always want the best for us, even when we do not understand your plans. So we come to you now in prayer, asking for your kingdom to come. We thank you that we each have a home that gives us shelter and warmth. We thank you that we live in a caring community and we have been relatively spared during this pandemic. We pray for your kingdom to come as we think of those who are living in refugee camps, homeless on the streets or without adequate shelter. We pray for those who live in broken communities disrupted by poverty, war, crime, or disease. Please bring hope and restoration to these places. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you that this morning we could choose which clothes we wanted to wear. We had the right clothes for the weather and shoes that fitted. We pray for your kingdom to come for those who have to make do and mend, who have to rely on handouts from others and charity shops, and especially for parents who cannot provide what their children need. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the breakfast we have eaten, for the coffee and tea we have drunk, and for the treats like orange juice. We pray for your kingdom to come, for those who grow crops for us, may they receive a fair price. Please protect their crops from too little or too much rain and give them the skills and equipment they need. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the clean water that comes out from our taps, for our toilets which flush and showers and baths. We pray for your kingdom to come so that these basic requirements will be there for everyone. We pray for water aid, toilet twinning, and other initiatives that bring these resources to people without them. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you that we can read and write and for the world of opportunities that this opens up to us. We thank you for our local schools and pray for the teachers, classroom assistants and university staff having to adapt to the current circumstances. We pray for your kingdom to come for those who have struggled with education because of poor teaching or who have not received education because of poverty or war. Please help them with adult education and training. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for our health and those who provide local health services. We are blessed with nurses, doctors, opticians, audiology and podiatry services and home care services. There are also hospital services and nursing homes for those who are unable to look after themselves. Please support and encourage those working in these health services. We pray for your kingdom to come where health services do not exist, drugs are not available, and children and adults die of preventable disease. We also pray for those known to us who are suffering in body, mind or spirit at this time. We thank you that we can bring them before you 
and know that you love each one individually. In a moment of quiet, we bring before you those that we know and ask that you will be with them in their distress, whether that be mental, physical or spiritual. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you that for those who have accepted your redeeming love, that there is a place prepared for them in your Father's house. We pray for any who have recently died and for those mourning their loss, and also for those mourning the loss of those who died some time ago, but are still finding it difficult to move on. We ask that you will support their family and friends and comfort them with the promise of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for this season of Advent. We pray for your kingdom to come and reign in our hearts. May we each share something of your light as we prepare for your return. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sue, for those prayers. We now join our prayers with Sue's in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we come now to our um, time of uh, sharing, um, because normally we'd have coffee in the hall at the back of church there where we could talk to one another and um, share news and things, but we can't do that at the moment. So um, instead we have this time. Anyone got anything they want to share? Joe, you want to... Don't get to take mask off. Got to prepare myself. Good morning. Did you know that in Shakespeare's day, he only had between 15 and 20 actors in his troupe at any one time? Well, as most of his plays had 25 or more characters, many had to double or even triple up. Now remember, this was a time when they were sewn into costumes, or pinned into costumes, and cloth was really expensive. So often, all they could possibly do to completely change the role was to simply add a headdress or a cloak. What's this got to do with us? Fast forward to today. On Christmas Eve, we're going to have a crib service in the grounds. We too will be outside. Wouldn't it be amazing if by a simple transformation <laughs> Is that a wise man? What is that? A shepherd. Oh, an angel. Anyone in the crowd who's turned up without a costume could come and be transformed and join in. Well, that's where you will come in, please. We would like to offer to everyone who rocks up and hasn't had a chance to dress up a bag containing a headdress. 
So they could be a shepherd, a king, an angel. I can't actually see out of this. Or Mary. So we need, please, tinsel. Because I know, hard to believe that that's all this is. Tea towels. Elastic would be really handy if anyone's got some bits of elastic sitting in their box. And gold card. And finally, if somebody would be prepared to help me cut the gold card to make crowns, that would be amazing. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any cloth in the way of, oh, a sheet. Clean, please. But old one they don't want back. White or pale blue. Because I wondered if we could also maybe make some Mary headdresses. I don't know about you, but when I was at school, I was never allowed to be Mary. I was only ever the tall girl in the back row of the chorus. So this is an opportunity for everybody, everybody that comes, old and young, to be able to join in. So I will put it on the spotlight, but I really need it for next weekend. Drop it in a bag. Tea towels, I will wash them all and get them in the porch, but I don't think you should give me your best ones just in case. So to end this um, share, uh, I think I've painted the scene. Well, almost. I'm going to give you a tiny bit of the script in a minute. Roz is sourcing a donkey. Martin has already started to clear us a stable outside. And... Welcome to all of you. You can't take a seat. We want you to share a nativity treat to mothers and fathers and carers and grands. We thank you for coming. Now, these are our plans. This story of Christmas, we'll tell it in rhyme. And that's where I'm leaving it. Oh. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Do come on Christmas Eve. Do you know, the height of my acting career was in a nativity play. I was a tree. <laughs> very, very proud of that moment in my life. <laughs> Anyone else got anything else to share? Jane? to bring them to you, just get in contact with us. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Following on from our sermon this morning, I thought I ought to share, I, I am sorry, I forgot the prayer list this morning, so I was just going to read out the names of the people that we have asked for our prayers. For Derek, for Maeve, for Pam, for Pauline, for Graham, for Bob, for Clive, for Jennifer, for Christopher, for Jenny, and for Kay, we ask for a special blessing of your love and peace with them. Amen. Thank you, Sue. Anyone else got anything to share? Cynthia. Good morning, and thank you, Simon, for your sermon on repentance. Um, it's just prompted me to share with you a, a story of somebody who came in our house this week to help us, and uh, he arrived, skinhead, tattoos all up and down his arm, and um, 
but a nice, friendly face. Brown was talking to him about street pastors, and he said, oh, they really helped me. Ten years ago, in New Milton, I was going down the plug hole, and I really wasn't going to make it. It was either going to be death or jail. Those were his words. And he said, street pastors would stop and talk to me. And then I was mentored by a man who had got the most wonderful prophetic name. I'm not going to tell you all this because I don't want to give the gentleman away. But this man mentored him. And today, this man is a vibrant Christian. And his life has turned round. And he repented of the things he was into because he was part of the way that young people run, grow up and all the, all the temptations and dangers that there are. But he turned away, and he's now a vibrant Christian and pleased to share the way that the Lord has changed his life. And I just wanted to share that because actually we need to hear the stories of people whose lives have been changed. We can read about them, but boy, is it great to meet them. And these people are all around us. In fact, we are all these people. If we come to the Lord and ask for him to forgive us for the things we've done wrong that we know about and plenty that we don't know about. And he, he comes and he lives with us and he changes our lives. And we also can go out and share the joy of that new life. So that's one story. I also just wanted to say quickly, if I may, that one of the things in Advent is we sing the most amazing hymns. And we've sung one this morning. And in these Advent hymns, there are references to all sorts of subjects we don't often talk about and we don't often really understand, but it's just part of the Christian journey. But today we read... Israel's strength and consolation. And I just want to leave you with the thought that we're living in the times that the prophets spoke about. And these are the times that when we read the prophets, they spoke about a time when Israel would be back in the land. And these are the times before Jesus comes and the question will be, is it your first or your second coming? And these are such extraordinary days we're living in. And we can see the world turned upside down, but God is in it. And we can understand it because if we read the prophets, we know his word is sure. And every detail has been, is being, and will be fulfilled. What a privilege to be alive today. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Anyone from home, anything to share, can just speak and you'll be highlighted on the screen. No? Okay. So we come to our um, final hymn. Um, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So if you, ever, if you read Mark's Gospel, that amazing statement at the beginning is this the good news of Jesus Christ, um, which is a ridiculous statement. So what Mark is actually saying is that this man, it's not just a man, it's not just a prophet, it's not just a teacher or a good chap, it's God, which is an outrageous statement. And um, as I said, Mark goes on then to say why he believes that's actually true. And if it's true, it's not just a matter of interest, is it? It's a life-changing, world-changing everything changing event and that's um you know the the great things god has done it, it showed us what he's really like through coming to us in a way that we can understand and relate to that's what this song's about that's what advent's about cynthia
May God the Father, judge all merciful, make us worthy of a place in his kingdom. Amen. May God the Son, coming among us in power, reveal in our midst the promise of his glory. Amen. May God the Holy Spirit make us steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with all whom you love, now and always. Amen. Now, just a few notices um, before we uh, finish. Um, year of Prayer continues. Um, tomorrow night here at 7.30, I'm doing a seminar on praying with Scripture. So just looking at how we can use our Bibles um, in our prayer times to just creatively and reflectively um, using the word of God to help us in our prayers. So do come to that if you can. Compline continues on Wednesday 7.30 here in church. It won't be uh, via Zoom uh, this week with Jo speaking to us about her prayer life and how um, that's developed and supported and helped her. And the week after we have a nun, I think Sister Karina I think it is, from the uh, convent near Limington who will be coming to speak to us. So do come to that as well if you can. Christmas services, look online on posters in the parish mag to see when they are, lots going on. Next Sunday we have our toy service here, which basically just means bring a toy, a new one that's unwrapped and leave it on the chancel step and they will all go to support the work of Scratch, um, that supporting families that would, well, just don't have the things we take for granted and find it very hard to give gifts at Christmas. So please be generous if you can with regards uh, to that. Um, Advent calendar, I hope you've been looking online at the Advent calendar. It's been great um, on our website with people contributing a different picture, poem, verse, something like that each day to help us just reflect on what Advent's all about. Do have a look. Lent boxes. It's been a long Lent, hasn't it? <laughs> so at the beginning of Lent, hopefully you took some boxes home to put money in that was going off to support the training of pastors in Rwanda where the government's brought in legislation that says unless the pastors there have a degree, they can't work anymore. 
Um, most of them haven't got degrees, um, and they haven't got the money to pay f to have those degrees. So we're supporting them in doing that. Um, it's now time to send that money off. So if you bring those boxes into one of these services or just drop them into the office, that will all get sent out to Rwanda. So please do that. Um, Christmas Zoom quiz. Um, Liz said I was rather vague about this week, so I'll try my best this week. Um, Liz, um, Friday, um, 11th December, 7.30, we have a Christmas quiz. We did it about a month ago. It was great fun. If you want to sign up, then do contact Liz. Her email uh, details are there. That's it. Lots of other notices. Do read them. Um, if e everything that we talked about this morning in this service, you're sort of scratching your head thinking, you know, Jesus Christ, is he really the son of God? What's all that about? Then we're starting an alpha course in January. Details on our website. Come, sign up to that. Um, it's a place where you can ask in safety all those questions you've may maybe always wanted to ask about how do we know that Jesus is God and so what? How does that affect me in my life? If you're interested in finding out more about that, then Alpha is for you. And do tell your friends about that as well. Hopefully they'll sign up as well. So would you please stand? Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.